right, go ahead and take your Bibles and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Very important message I want to try to teach you tonight. Tonight I've got a big challenge on my hands. I'm going to try to reprogram you all after you know years of just um, American culture, uh, television, uh, all these things. You know, there's a lot of things we've had shoved down our throats that I'm just afraid we bought into. And so what I'm going to share with you tonight, completely biblical, uh, very important subject for families, especially if you are raising children. Uh, you, ne- you need to understand these things and you need to teach these things. You need to prepare for these things in your family. And I think the subject, uh, some of the things we'll be covering is just, you know, I, I, I've had several questions recently just asked me on this, about this very subject. And I was like, you know, I've not preached a lot on that subject. I probably should preach on that more because people, they don't know what to do. And I think part of it is just, um, what the Bible teaches here and what, what we do in, um, you know, what the Bible teaches us to do, it's just not popular. It's not part of our culture. Some of this stuff might sound kind of weird, but um, the title of my message tonight is Flee Fornication. And in parentheses, I have basically part of the title is the way we flee fornication is get a wife. Flee fornication, get a wife. And you might think that sounds strange, but I'm going to show you that is completely biblical. Fornication is one of the biggest sins in America. I mean, one of the things that's running rampant. In our country, and also I want to be careful. Now, I know we've got you know children in here, and I don't want to uh, I don't want to get too graphic tonight or anything. But you know, there's a lot of things that they need to hear. Things we need to be teaching our children on this subject. But fornication, it is a very wicked sin. And listen, if you're watching television, if you're letting your kids watch television on the internet, they're already getting exposed to so much filth. You know, if they're in the public school, they're going to be seeing a lot of this stuff and they need to hear the truth. People need to know the truth on this subject. It is so important. Fornication is so wicked and it's something that has no place amongst God's people. The consequences of it are devastating. And let's go ahead and read 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 12. We see some warnings in here about fornication. And then when we get into chapter seven, we're going to get into that later. It tells us how to avoid. I think the main way to avoid fornication is get a wife. And so let's go ahead and start reading in verse 12. It says, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought into the power of any meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God hath both both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You see fornication mentioned several times in there. And listen, if you go to most churches today, you won't even hear that word even mentioned. You're not going to hear preaching against this thing. But let me tell you, throughout the New Testament, okay, this isn't just an Old Testament thing. Throughout the New Testament, over and over again, it is reminded to stay away from fornication. And one of the main reasons I think it is, is because it was just such a common thing among the Gentiles. It was a part of their culture. You know, they had no morals. They lived like animals. And unfortunately, it's gotten that way in America. We used to be a very moral country. But let me tell you, our morals have just gone down the toilet in this country. And fornication, it's completely normal. It's completely acceptable. There are churches today that are full of people, members of the church, in good standing, who are fornicators, people who are shacking up and they see absolutely no problem with it. And it's like, why do these people not realize this is a problem? Because nobody's preaching about it. Nobody's talking about it. But the first thing I want to show you before we get into how we flee fornication is we need to see just how serious this is. Because it's not 
a serious thing in the American culture. The American culture today, the reason they're doing the sex ed and stuff in the public schools and teaching it at kids at such a young age is because the world's philosophy is, you know what, they're going to do it. So let's just, you know, let's warn them. You know, let's show them how they can, you know, be safe. You know, let's show them how they can avoid, you know, unwanted pregnancies and diseases and things like that because they're going to do it. And nobody gets up and teaches these kids, you know, that it's morally wrong. Well, because where do morals come from? They come from the Word of God. And they're not going to do that. They couldn't do that. That would be offensive today to go and tell children you should not be fornicating when their moms and dads are shacking up. When their moms and dads are living in fornication. And so it's just the mentality today, they're going to do it. So let's try to help them out. Let's give them, you know, free birth control. Let's give them free this and free that and show them how to use these things. And that is so wicked. It's not even, we ought to be disgusted by that. It ought, it ought to make us sick that our world's that way. And you know, it's one thing that the world's that way, but it's another thing when it's crept into the churches. And when it's so accepted that preachers are scared to preach against fornication, listen, fornication has no place amongst God's people. And we need to understand how serious this is because we're so used to it. You see, many, you know, I'm afraid, you know, I'm just, you know, assuming you're like most people in the world that you don't think it's a big deal because you watch television all the time and you see how these people, they just do whatever they want whenever they feel like it. And there's no consequences there. I mean, and so, you know, it's obviously not a big deal. There are huge consequences. This is serious. And I'm just going to go through a bunch of verses. You don't have to follow along. But Galatians 5.19 says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. There is a difference between adultery and fornication. Okay? Adultery is when you do something, uh, you know, with someone out that you are not married to when you're married. Fornication is just anything outside of marriage. And we need a real, and it is, it's the work of the flesh. What does that mean? Well, it's, it's going to come natural to the flesh. There are some things that our flesh desires that are wrong, that are sinful. We have a fallen nature and the mentality of our society today is if you, you know, have an inclination for that or an orientation towards that, there can't be anything wrong with it, but that's wrong. It is, it is wrong. We all, you know, we're all inclined to lose our temper. We're inclined to be selfish. We're orientated towards, you know, being self-centered and things like that. But does that mean, you know, we have, should have a right to do those things, have a right to, you know, it being all about me. Do I have a right if I, you know, if I, maybe, you know, maybe I'm a kleptomaniac, you know, maybe I just see things. I have a sickness. I have to steal. So, you know, how dare they have laws telling me I can't do something that I was born to do? You know, I want to steal. And we've got these people, they use those same arguments about homosexuality and trying to say that it's right and it's legal because that's what they are inclined to do. That's absolutely, completely bogus. I expect that kind of thing from a messed up, perverted world. But when Christians start buying into that, we've got a huge problem. But listen, fornication is a work of the flesh. So you know what? Yes, you're going to, you might desire to do these things. You know, your children, as they grow up, they're going to be tempted to do these things, but it's not okay. It is absolutely not okay. And it is wicked and it has devastating consequences. First Corinthians 10, eight says, neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day, three and 20,000. This is in the new Testament. He's saying, let's not commit fornication. And one day there were 23,000 people that God killed because of the sin of fornication. This is a big deal. And people do, oh, well, we're in New Testament now. It's all about grace. First Corinthians 10 is New Testament. And listen, this doesn't mean God's going to kill 23,000 people if somebody commits fornication. But you know what those stories in the Old Testament teach us? This is how God feels about fornication. He killed 23,000 people because of it. And just because he's not doing it today doesn't mean it doesn't make him mad. And God will be angry with you if you do that. God will be angry at our church if that kind of thing is going on in our church. And so let's not do that. God killed 23,000 people one time. Listen, we know people lie in church. But do we see people dropping dead like Ananias and Sapphira? No. Does that mean God doesn't care anymore? No. God put that story in the Bible showing us, hey, this is how God feels about lying. 
And so we should, just because we're not dropping dead, you know, people aren't dropping dead when they lie, doesn't mean we shouldn't be lying. No, we should learn from that story and say, this is how God feels about lying. So you know what? We're not going to do it. And we need to learn from the 23,000 people killed because of fornication. Say, God obviously has a huge problem with that. Hebrews 12, 11 says, Now no chastening for this present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous nevertheless afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble needs, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it be rather be healed. Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, diligently, lest any man fail the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward that he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Y'all see what's going on here. He, in Hebrews, this warning is, listen, don't let there be any fornicator among you. Because remember how Esau, he sold his birthright and later he was sorry he did it. Later, he looked for repentance. He wanted to get that birthright back. I mean, he sought it. He's crying. He's that sorry for what he had done. But you know what? He was rejected. It was too late. There are some things you just don't come back from. And fornication is one of those things. When we need to understand that we have a forgiving God, but there are some things that you're just, you're crossing a line and you, you just can't go there. And you think, well, you know, I'll just, you know, we've all heard the saying, you know, I'd rather ask for forgiveness than for permission. Well, you might be able to do that with some things, but there are some things you're not going to be able to do that with. And fornication is one of those things. And you need to understand that the consequences of fornication, they can be lifelong. And listen, God can forgive you and you can still get saved and you can still go to heaven, but you are going to deal with the consequences here on this earth for the rest of your life. And so don't do it. Stay away from it. Keep away from it. And then, um, and so there, there's some things that they can't be undone. God can forgive you, but you're going to keep dealing with those consequences. And so fornication, it has no place amongst God's people in the church. And this, I'm not even going to show you all the scriptures on this subject. But it's amazing how this subject is avoided like a plague in many churches today. And it's going on in many churches today. Yet this is one thing, all right? This is one specific sin that is mentioned throughout the New Testament. You keep that out of the church. And we see how there's many examples in the Bible about, you know, the liberty that we have in Christ. And there's things, you know, that God will forgive us. And, you know, we're not under the law. This, it's not about, you know, keeping the law to be saved or turning from your sins or anything like that. But when it comes to, and it was like, because of that grace, there was always that danger of getting this idea that because, you know, we're under grace and we can't lose our salvation, people might try to take advantage of it. And you know, any sin is a transgression of the law. Any sin is a sin. Any sin is bad. But you know what? We're not told to throw people out of the church for just any sin. The Bible in the New Testament is very specific on certain things. There are, I'm sorry, there's some sins that are worse than other sins. There are some sins that have greater punishments and have greater consequences. And fornication is one of these sins. And it's mentioned over and over again. And in um, Ephesians 5 verse 3, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. It has no place in the church. Acts 15, 19, wherefore my sense is that we trouble not them, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Right here, what's going on if you read that whole passage all of a sudden now Gentiles are being saved. And Gentiles, in their culture, they had really no morals. I mean, just, you know, it wasn't like the Jews that taught that fornication was a sin. You know, the, the Jews, as messed up as they were, they at least had cer a certain moral code. 
And there were things in synagogues across the world where the Jews have been scattered. There were certain things they knew were, I mean, wrong and wicked and things like, you know, eating the blood, eating meat with the blood, um, you know, I- idolatry and fornication. They knew those things were wicked. And so here you have these people, they're getting saved. And there was a group of Jews saying, well, you know what? They have to keep the law. They've got to get circumcised in order, in order to be saved. And they said, no, that's not true. You don't have to keep any of the laws to be saved. Okay? The way you be sa- sa- get saved is by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. But listen, we've got to have some rules amongst God's people. We've got to have some rules among the church. Okay, Anybody who is saved, there are sins that you can do and you're not going to lose your salvation. Okay, you're, there, There's no sin you can do that will make you lose your salvation. But there are sins that can cause you to lose your place in the church. Because we've got to have a testimony. We've got to make sure that you know, we keep the leaven out of the church. And so there were those three things they mentioned. Don't be eating the meat with the blood. Don't be worshiping idols. And don't fornicate. And they, they said, make sure you tell them these things because they have no place among God, amongst God's people. And, so, and then in verse 29... Or verse 28 of that same chapter, it says, For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things that ye abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, for which if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do where, fare ye well. And this, in that story, these people, they were thrilled when they found out they didn't have to get circumcised. They were all, they were all excited about that, but they said, listen, there are some things that are just necessary amongst God's people. We can't have these things. And fornication was one of the things. From the very beginning of the church, that was very clear. This has no place amongst God's people. Doesn't mean if somebody's saved and they fornicate, they're not going to heaven. It doesn't mean they lost their salvation, but they have lost fellowship with the church if they do that type of thing. That's how serious it is. And Acts chapter 21, verse 25 says, as touching the Gentiles, which believe, we have written and concluded that they observed uh, no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. Uh, Colossians 3, 5 says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. And then 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. Now, why were they constantly mentioning that? Because this was a problem amongst the Gentiles. They had no morals. Now, in America, you know, 50 years ago, you didn't have to preach on this that much because our society frowned on fornication and especially amongst God's people. You know, they, they were against this type of thing. But our culture today, we are not a Christian nation, nation anymore. We are a Gentile nation. Okay? And not just because we're not Jews. I mean, we've got a Gentile culture. In other words, it's one without law. It's one without morals. And it, we have gone down so, downhill so far in just you know, my lifetime. And so many of these things are accepted. But listen, God's word has not changed Fornication is as wicked as it ever was, and it has no place uh, in the church and amongst God's people. And you, it, split church splits happen all the time because it'll go on, and they'll throw somebody out of the church, and everybody gets all offended. I can't believe they did that. I can't believe they threw them out of the church. You're going to side with the fornicator, really? After all the Bible says about that, oh, well, you know. And sometimes too, I mean, it's just no question. These people are living in sin. You know, they're shacking up, they're fornicating, and you know, and the pastor will tell them, you know, just leave the church, and you know, and everybody's like, oh, you know, the pastor doesn't have the authority to just throw somebody out of the church and that, you know, it's supposed to go before the whole church and all this stuff. They kind of, they they get carried away with some of the church discipline stuff. I don't have time to go into all that. But we don't need to have a meeting if somebody's fornicating on whether to throw them out or not. That decision's already been made. Okay, it's right there in the Bible, not to let it be once named among you. We don't need to put it to a vote. We don't need to vote those people out of the church. They need to be, they, you know, we need to try to give them a chance to repent, of course. You know, the, and if they do get thrown out, 
The goal is restoration. We want, we want these people to get right. We want to restore them. We want to get them back in the fold. You know, we, we've got to show patience too. When people get saved out of our American culture, we, you know, it's very likely they might be living in sin. They might be living in fornication. And we've got to, you know, we've got to introduce them to morality. We've got to, we might have to introduce them to the scriptures and say, hey, I understand you just got saved. I understand all this is new to you, but let me show you what the Bible says. It's pretty sad that you know we're probably you know you know we're going to be the one introducing these people to this stuff, but we can't change the message. We can't update it. God still hates it, and I do, I believe He'll forgive people for it. I believe that they can be restored and become a part of the church, but understand the consequences of what they've done. It's going to go with them through their life. There's, there's no two ways about that. We can't, we can't do anything about that. We can just restore them, try to help them. But um, in the meantime, why don't we warn everyone else who hasn't done it yet? Instead of worrying about offending these people, oh, we don't want to bring up this stuff and make them feel bad because they're past, past sins. No, we have to do it. And you know what? If they've learned the hard way that that's wrong, they should be the biggest people cheering us on. Okay, If you've messed up in that area in the past, if you've made that mistake, listen, God can forgive you, but you know firsthand the consequences of that thing, and you ought to be the one, I mean, cheering this kind of preaching on more than anybody, because you know I'm telling the truth. You know there's consequences, and you know they're difficult, and we need to do whatever we can to spare the children in this church and spare these young people the pain of a life of fornication and the consequences of that. And so we've got to preach it. We've got to preach hard against it. And as our culture goes down the toilet more and more, we need to be screaming us from the housetops even more. Otherwise, they're going to get tempted. We're desensitized to these things. When I, when I got my first job at McDonald's, I grew up in a Christian home, went to a Christian school, and I was floored when I found out that most of the people I worked with were shacking up. It just, it blew my mind. I was not used to that. I did not understand that. I worked with a lady who, she was always talking about her boyfriend, and I, I would hear things, and as I started putting two and two together, I figured out, they live together. I remember I heard her say something one time and mentioned something that was clear. They had been sleeping in the same bed. And I was like, where am I working? Sodom and Gomorrah? You know what I mean? What is going on? I, I was blown away by that. I, 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 was, I was that is, I was 16 years old and it blew my mind. All my managers when I was at McDonald's, all of them except for one that was a Christian, all of them were either, they were either shacking up and had kids and no husbands. All of them. And I'm like, you know, I, I always thought that was like, I mean, you know, those just dirty riffraff in the city. You know, the people out, you know, panhandling, begging, that, that, that kind of thing. You know, not, not managers. People in management position live in that kind of just, you know, disgusting lifestyle. I, could, I couldn't believe it. That's what I grew up with. Okay. Now, it, you know, it's not that way today. It's not, it's not that way. I'm afraid we've got, become desensitized to it. But God hasn't become desensitized to it. It makes him just as sick today as it ever has. And so I need to move. I, I'm hoping, I, I hope I can get through this whole message tonight. But um, it, So you know, the world understands we're naturally bent on fornication. But they, do, they make the mistake of, because we're bent on that, thinking it must not be wrong. It comes natural, therefore it's okay. And Christians... You know, we often make the mistake of thinking what's something a Christian would never want to do. Parents, they, uh, many parents who got saved, you know, later in life, maybe after they were married, you know, they wonder why their kids that they've raised in church, they put in a Christian school or they homeschooled, they all wonder why their children, when they become teenagers, they start getting tempted with these things. And they're like, what's the matter? You know, I mean, yeah, I did that back when I wasn't saved. But, you know, now that I'm saved, I don't do it anymore. Well, listen, the main reason you don't do that anymore is because you learn the hard way. It makes you miserable. Your kids don't know that yet, but they have the same. They're made out of the same flesh that you're made out of. And it's going to be a temptation. Why? Because it's the works of the flesh and they've got the flesh. And so you've got to drill this into their head. You know, boys and girls, you know, one of these days, you know, as your boys grow up, they're going to figure out that, you know, girls... They don't have cooties, you know. Uh, they're going to kind of like them, so you're going to teach them. 
don't touch. And you know what? You're going to have to learn to look away from some things. You have to teach them some of these things. And so how do we flee fornication? For, so uh, in chapter, the end of chapter 6, it mentions fleeing fornication. Verse 16 or 18, flee fornication. Talks about how you're sinning against your own body when you do that. So how can we flee fornication? This is a temptation. Your boys and your daughters are going to be tempted with these things. How can you help them avoid this horrible sin of fornication? Then you, then you get married. Then you get married. That's all there is to it. Look at what it says in chapter 7, verse 1. It's continuing the thought here. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. But wait a minute. Guys want to touch a woman. You know, it's, they, they have that desire. But God says it's good for them not to do it. What's, what's going on here? But verse 2 says, nevertheless, to avoid fornication. All right? You need, you're gonna, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. But we need to avoid fornication. What's he saying here? You're going to want to do it. And that's a no-no. You can't do that. This is wicked. So how can we avoid this sin of fornication? To avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Why is that? Well, because the marriage is honorable and all and the bed undefiled. People, a young man, young lady who are married, they can touch all they want and it's not a sin. It's not fornication. God is ple- God is okay with that. God is, God has no problem with that. That is 100% okay and that will fulfill those desires and you will not commit that horrible devastating sin of fornication. Verse 3. Even after you're married, you know, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body. But the wife, defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Now, I don't want to get too descriptive on this stuff here, but you all see that even when you're married, the Bible is saying you need to continually be available for each other. And even if you're going to have a time of fasting, if you're going to go through a period of time of fasting, you get each other's permission to do that because during the, when you are apart, it opens yourself up to temptation even when you're married. And there is, there is a natural physical desire for the opposite sex that it needs to be fulfilled, but it should only be fulfilled amongst a husband and a wife. That's it. And so we, you need to understand that even when you're married, it can be, you, you're putting yourself in a dangerous situation when y'all aren't taking care of each other because we have a wicked, sinful flesh and it's going to start desiring things. And so God gave the husband and wife for that very purpose. So we can avoid these things. And, uh, you know, I'm being as delicate as I, delicate as I can on these things, but listen, you need to get a wife. Okay. Your boys and your girls, they need, they need to get married. We have the, in our society today, they tell you, no, you need to go to college first. You need to get, do your career first. You need to go do this. You need to do that. And you know, when you're like 30, then you can get married. That's foolish. That is foolish. That is just opening them up for temptation. And listen, I don't know, maybe some guys in their 20s don't care. I was not that guy. All right? I don't think most guys are that way. And you know, like anybody else, like any other human being in the world, saved or lost, I had the desire for a woman. But thank God I was at least taught you don't get that until you're married. And so you know what? I got engaged at 19 and had the longest six month period of my life just, you know, waiting for a six month engagement. That's stupid. All right. I mean, not, and you know, I guess I needed that. You know, I was getting ready to start a new job and getting a play, house ready and all those things. You need to do those things, but good night. Longest six months of my life. And my wife, you know, she, she's brought up in the past. Oh, you know, so, you know, back in the days we were dating, it was so nice. You know, and I'm like, no, it wasn't. It was horrible. That was horrible. I would never want to go back to that. Listen, dating is for the birds. All right. I mean, that, that is no fun at all. I mean, it's like, how could you think that was great? 
Oh, you know, we were so in love. Oh, you were so romantic, blah, blah, blah. You know, it was a nightmare. You know, her mom could tell me when to leave the house. You know, you know, my, you know I was still living at home for a part of that time. You know, my dad told you know, be home at this time and all that stuff. And, and we, you know, we didn't go places by ourselves. We weren't going to open ourselves up for that kind of temptation because it, it would have been there. My sisters were always around or her sisters were always around. You know, parents breathing down our necks. It was a nightmare. And it was the greatest thing in the world when we got married and we got in that car together by our souls for the first time and we said, bye-bye, everybody. <laughs> and we were alone and got to spend the next, you know, the next week or so together 24-7 for our honeymoon. It was the greatest thing ever. But before that, nightmare. And I would never want to go back to that in a thousand years. It is a zillion times better being married. And so I, I don't know why women say that kind of thing. That's, I think that's just absolutely foolish. But you do. And so what can a young man do to help himself find a wife? Well, Pro, Proverbs 18.22 says, Whoso findeth a wife uh, findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. You know what? It's okay to look. It's okay to look. Listen, if, if you are a young man, and unless you are one of those eunuchs that they talk about, all right, which I don't think there's too many of those, okay, you're going to want a wife. So you know what? Look for it. You need it. And the Bible says, whoso findeth a wife. Sounds to me like you're looking. And if you find it, you found a good thing and you obtain favor of the Lord. And so you need to make sure you're in the will of God. Finding favor of the Lord. God's smiling on you. God's being good to you. You want God's blessing in your life? Make sure you're right in the center of God's will. You got a lot of young men, they're like, they have this attitude, oh, you know, I got to find a wife and then I'll figure out what God wants me to do. No, you find that out first. You find out what does God want you doing right now in your life? What is God's will for your life right now? And God knows you need a wife. And so he's going he's gonna to give you one. You want to get married young? You want to get married at the earliest possible you know, age? Be in the will of God. If, but if you go and you get away from God and you backslide, you're just going to delay those things. You're going to open yourself up to temptation. You're probably going to get yourself in trouble. And so you just need to get yourself right in the will of God. And that way you can get God's blessing because a man who finds a wife, the Bible says, is a pain, favor of the Lord. And so you, uh, so get in God's will. Make sure you're right smack dab in the middle of God's will. Matthew nineteen four said, and he answered and said to them, Have ye not read that which he made them at the beginning, made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Now, I need to try to reprogram you here on this one, but the Bible says, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. Talking about marriage. That, that's why you leave father and mother. Not because you turned 18. If you turn 18 and you just leave the house, you're opening yourselves up for temptation. You might not fornicate during that time, but you know what? Young men, eight, most 18, 19, 20-year-olds I know are pretty stupid. And they need that supervision. And you don't want to get yourself in trouble. You don't want to fornicate. You can do a lot of damage to your life in those three or four years. And so, you know, the, the God's will, it's not that for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, Bible college, you know, secular university, things like that. You're opening yourself up for some serious, serious temptation. And we do, even in Bible colleges today, they go and they'll send these young men and their young, you know, their daughters away from home to go, you know, live on these campuses where they're just surrounded. You know, these young men are surrounded by women who went to college with the main goal of getting their MRS degree. You know, they're looking for husband, and and this stuff happens even in Bible colleges all the time where fornication goes on. I mean, there it's a such a tempting situation. The Bible says, "For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother." Talking about marriage, and I know that I know that's crazy. Oh, what well, if the guy doesn't get married till he's 25 or 26? You think they need to live at home for that long? Why is it going to take him that long? Is his personality that pathetic? Listen, if you're, if you got, if you, listen, there's women out there that want husbands, but you know the problem they have today? They can't find a guy who's got a stable job. 
They can't find a guy who's just got some decent character that's a hard worker that's not dependent on mommy. They can't find a guy that just isn't a pervert. And so it's hard for them. If you can just raise a boy that's a hard worker, that can get a stable job where he can provide for a wife and a family, I'm telling you, he's not going to have any trouble finding a wife. But a lot of these guys can't do that. That's one of the biggest questions the dad's going to ask. How are you going to provide for my daughter? And if some, you know, 23, 24-year-old guy who's unemployed comes to me and expresses interest in my daughter, it's not happening. No, you go get a job, punk. You know, you go do something with your life. You know, you're not living in my basement. And I don't want my daughter living in your mom's basement. You'll all be miserable if you do that. And so you need, we need to train them for that. And we need to teach them at a young age to be hard workers and, uh, and to learn how to provide. And because that's what you leave home for when you are ready to start a family yourself, because it is when you're by yourself, it's dangerous. But when you have that wife taking care of your needs, it, it takes away that temptation. And you're going to be, you're in a much better position. You've got that accountability. It's the way God intended it. I know that's foreign, but it's just the truth. So we, you, know, you need to ignore the world's rules about leaving home at 18. That's just stupid. And you need to make sure that you have a close walk with God. Okay? Teach your children to have a close walk with God. And God's going to give them what they need. And I, I do. I, I, they need spouses. And they, they're in the will of God. God's going to help them find one. And so make sure, uh, look at 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. And this is something I see a lot too. When I was younger, when I was, uh, you know, when I was 18 and 19, I had my driver's license and stuff, you know, one of the things that I did all the time, I did a lot of spiritual stuff during that time. You know, when I was young and I didn't have a wife, I didn't have any kids, sometimes on Saturday, we'd just go soul winning the whole day. Hey, you know, some of my friends, hey, let's just go soul winning the whole day. We'd have, we'd have all day soul winning. You know, we, I mean, just... We could do that. We go to the preaching meetings all the times. We go to the you know conferences. We we drive all over. We could go to these things. We had time to do that. We had the money to do those things. You know because uh, you know we didn't have many responsibilities. But you know what? There, there's a lot of guys today. I, I see that same thing. They're doing that, and you know they don't have stable jobs because they're doing all these spiritual things. And I'm 100 percent for doing. The spiritual stuff. But y'all understand, if you want to have a wife, you need to be able to provide for her. And you know what? Anybody can be faithful to soul winning and faithful to the serving God and the house of God when they're single and they have no responsibilities. But it's a different thing when you do that, when you do have the responsibilities, when you have the full-time job. Six days shalt thou labor and do all that work. God expects us working. God expects you to provide for your family, to have a wife and kids, and they are going to require a lot of your time. And you and a, there's a difference between someone who can do all those things when they're single and someone who can do it when they're married. And that's why in the requirements for a bishop, you have things like the husband of one wife having his children in subjection with all gravity. You know why? Because there's a lot of people, they can do ministry work when they're single and don't have a lot of responsibilities. But you all understand that single person is going to be dealing with some serious temptation in the flesh. And so God said, we can't have that. And a better way to see who's qualified, let's see who is faithful to the house of God. Let's see who's faithful to serving God while they have a wife and children. Because I've seen that people who are faithful soul winners and did all that stuff, faithful to the house of God, as soon as they got married and had children, they were too busy for all that stuff. Well, while they might have looked like they were fit for the ministry when they were single, it's clear they weren't fit for the ministry. And so the, the thing is, the younger you get started on you know, serving God with the wife and children, I believe the easier it would be. Because one of the things that we, we do in this culture, especially young people too, you know, they teach them if they do get married young, you know, wait a few years before you get married. You know, save up your money, buy a house, do all these things. And that sounds so smart, doesn't it? You know, they make it sound so smart when you do those things. Uh, Just do the math. It works, folks. But here's, here's reality, okay? When it comes to financial things, it's not always about the math. It's about behavior. And here's what happens when with young people who get married and they wait a long time to have kids. 
the wife has nothing to do. Husband's at work all day. Well, I might as well get a job too, and then we can afford all these extra things that we want. And so she gets a job too. Now they've got two car payments. You know, now, now, you know, now since we both have jobs, we can afford the higher mortgage. We can afford, you know, the nicer fo- food. We can afford to, you know, eat out when we want to. We can afford, you know, the bigger cable package. We can afford all these things. And then all of a sudden, a child comes along. And now she needs to quit her job. And now their income has just dropped greatly. Now they've got a new expense added on. And they're not used to this high standard of living. And they can't maintain it anymore. And it ends up getting, that child ends up getting them in a horrible financial trouble. And what was the problem? The problem is they just started out wrong. And, it, you know, when we got married, nine months later, Tommy was born. And so she never had time to get tempted with wanting to get a job. And we started out poor and we're still poor. All right. You know, so we never, we never had to, we never had to scale back on our standard of living. Okay. You know, in fact, our standard of living has gone up a little bit in the last 16 years. So, you know, we're pretty happy where if we would have both been working and living it up, you know, we would have been devastated, you know, uh, when we, when we had to step, when we had to scale back on those things. And so, you know, it is that, but that's happening to people all the time because they are, they're being taught, you know, you both work, save money. Listen, you go talk to the average, you know, dinks, they call them double income, no kids. All right. You go talk to them and you look at the lifestyle the you know, the lifestyle that they're living and go ask them how much money they've got saved up in the bank. Go ask, you know, go ask them. You know, they, they're lucky to have four figures saved up in the bank. You know, let's say they've got 10 grand saved up in the bank. Most of us would be like, wow, that's pretty good. Do you realize how fast that's going to go when little junior comes along? That's going to vanish so fast. It's not even funny because they have, they've, they've gotten this high standard of living and their income's about to drop while their expenses are going to increase. And it does, it's we're, our society is setting these people up for failure. They're setting them up to go deeply into debt. And so then the banks can own us the rest of our life. And we need to stop listening to these things. Get married young. I think, I think you ought to get married young and have your kids young. That, that's, my, that's my personal opinion. I think the Bible uh, backs me up on that. And so you, but you've got to ignore the world's rules on these things. And so, but if you're going to do that, you got to be able to provide. You got to be able, you got to teach your, your uh, young men to work hard. And to have character and to pay their stinking bills. Pay them on time. You gotta teach them that. And so for men leading a home and providing for a family, it's it's the most important earthly thing that you can do. Okay? The you know, the importance of soul winning, preaching the gospel, the work of the ministry, you know, you can't underemphasize those things. They're as important as all get up, but those are spiritual things that we accomplish. And you know what? We ought to do those things. God's upset when we don't do those things. But you know what? It is God's will for men to get married and raise children. And the Bible says those who don't provide for their family have denied the faith and are worse than an infidel. That's pretty strong language right there. It doesn't say that about people who don't go soul winning. Yeah, I think everybody ought to go soul winning. I think God expects that. But God never says those who don't go soul winning have denied the faith and are worse than an infidel. And so you got, you got a lot of these people and, and I, I knew a guy one time and he was one, you know, he's one of these real zealous people and everything. And I, I was just a kid when this happened. And I remember we went to a camp meeting and he was really wanting to go and he showed up to the camp meeting and he gave a testimony at the camp meeting that they told him in his job, he couldn't have the time off. So you know what he did? He quit his job and he went to the camp meeting. And I remember as a kid thinking, that was stupid. You know, and, and this guy was always having financial problems. He, you know, he was, he was always in trouble, but listen, the Bible doesn't say if you don't go to the camp meeting, you've denied the faith and are worse than an infidel, but it does say if you don't provide for your family and that's just foolishness and we need to understand, you know, these things are important. You got to teach your young men to work hard, to get a job. And so I do, I think that's one of the reasons God put those requirements for a bishop to be someone who's married and has children because that separates the men from the boys right there. A lot of people can do the work when they have no other responsibilities, but God wants that person to be a bishop, somebody who will do the work even when they have those responsibilities. Even when they've got a wife and they've got children, 
that, that separates the men from the boys right there. And so I've heard lots of guys. I've gone to church with people who they bragged about their soul winning exploits that they did when they were in Bible college. But they haven't done it in 20 or 30 years since then. Who cares what you did when you were forced to do it in Bible college? What have you done since you've been married and had kids and had a job? You tell me about that. And they got to go back 30 years to tell their stories. And so... Uh, not, not impressed. You know, anyone can serve God and they're single, but not everyone can do it when they're married and have children. And this is why it's important. I believe to get married and have children at a young age, the longer you wait, the more use you're going to get to that certain lifestyle. So, uh, you need to watch that. So, you know, go ahead, buy that fancy car when you're single, but you understand you're delaying marriage before we got married. My car I had, it was all my cars. I had two cars before we got married. We were on my second car when we got married. And that thing was not a chick magnet, let me tell you. I, I, did, I did not get her because of my fancy ride that I had. It was, it was cheap, and that was what I wanted because I needed to be able to pay the bills. You know, I could have got four or $500 car payment like some people did, but then I'm not going to be able to afford rent. And Dad wasn't going to let me get married and live in his house. And I didn't want to. So I got the cheap car. Cause I wanted the wife, you know, I, that, that was, you know, that was my priority, you know, go ahead, married couple, you know, that young married couple, go ahead, buy that fancy house, go ahead, you know, get those, you know, those two jobs. But when the kids come, you're probably going to get foreclosed on. So you better think about these things you need. We should plan. We should train our children with the mentality that you are going to leave my house. When you get married, you're going to get married young men. When you have a job that will provide for a wife, whatever will help you get to that point the fastest, you know, take that. Okay. If your boys are anxious to get a wife, that's fine. That's normal. I'm glad to hear they're a healthy functioning male, but you got to teach them. You're going to have to accomplish something first. You're going to have to earn this. You're going to have to get off your lazy carcass. You're going to have to turn off the television, the video games and get up early in the morning, set your own alarm clock. Mommy's not going to wake you up, and you are going to have to get a job. You have to keep that job. And if you think mommy and daddy was mean to you and bossed you around, you know, wait till you see that boss that you're going to have to listen to, and you better go learn to put up with that stuff, because if you don't, he's not going to be as nice as mommy and daddy are and just give you a spanking when you don't listen. You know He's going to fire you, and you're not going to have an income anymore. And we need. there are serious consequences. For these things. So we've got, we've got to teach them that. And then last thing, I, I, I probably should preach a whole message on this. You know, I, I'm going to touch on this and I, I might just preach a whole message on it coming up because I, I, I need to, I need to really park here for a while, but you've got to keep your heart and mind pure. You know why a lot of, one of the reasons a lot of guys I'm afraid just can't find a wife today is, be, you know, it's, a lot of these young men too, and I'll talk to these young men, all right? And listen, I'm a guy, okay? But I, I still know if a guy is not a stud or ugly, all right? And, I mean, you'll have these guys, they look like cavemen, all right? I mean, you know, no, they don't take care of themselves. They, you, know, they're just, they're, you know, some of these guys too, they're like looking for wives. I mean, they smell all the time. You know, and I'm just, you know... That's not going to help your causes here. You know, maybe you ought to, you know, go work out a little bit, you know, take a shower every now and then, you know, wear some cologne that might help you actually get a woman. But these same guys that are just disgusting to look upon, they have these expectations of wives that I was like, are you kidding me? You know, they expect their wives to look like some movie star whose entire life is devoted to looking good. Hey, are you going to be able to provide a living that will give your wife, you know, time to spend four or five hours in the gym every day? You know, are you going to be able to do that? You know, it, you know you're not going to be able to do that. And, you know, they expect these, they expect these, you know, godly women, you know, that look like a supermodel that are going to be able to have their children and still look like a supermodel after that. And it's like, where are you getting this idea from? And you know what? I am afraid that television is absolutely warping the minds of young men. They have no idea what reality is anymore. And I could tell you stories and things and the way that, uh, you know, just what pornography does to the mind of young men 
And it, it has warped them in ways that I cannot describe in mixed company. And I believe one of the reasons these a lot of young men can't find a wife is because they're expecting something and looking for something that's just it's just not there. It's just not reality. And where did they get to thinking? Where did they get to thinking that way? What made them feel that way? All the garbage that they're watching on television, on the internet, it has destroyed their mind. And I do. I, I worry about these guys that are getting up into their thirties and still don't have a wife. It's like, how are y'all doing with that? I don't think I, I don't think I'd be doing too good. I thought I was going to croak. I got married at twenty. What's going? These people's minds are getting twisted. There's a reason we've got so many queers in this world. There's a reason we've got so many perverts in this world. It's because of what these people are watching. Their minds are getting twisted. And th watching those things, seeing these things, it's only going to cause temptation towards fornication. And you've got to protect your children from that. You better, you better watch out, be careful. And it, it will completely distort their mind. And so I'm going to stop right there. But yeah, I need to preach a whole message on that subject. Very, very much needed. But flee fornication. We can't have it. It cannot be going on in our church. If we know, know about that kind of thing, I mean, we've got to put a stop to it. We've got to get rid of it. Why? You know, aren't, aren't you judging? No, I'm not judging anything. God said to do that. Okay? That's not me being judgmental. God said to do it. It's spelled out black and white. We don't need to put this stuff to a vote. You know, we don't need, you know, we don't need to discuss this. It's already laid out. Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd. This is the final authority on everything here. And it makes it really clear what's supposed to be done because this is a wicked sin. And we, we are doing, pastors are doing their churches and the young people, especially in the church, a disservice by not talking about this, by not mentioning it, by not warning them of the dangers of it. And these kids, they're watching this stuff on television and they don't even think nothing of it anymore. They're completely desensitized to it and it, the consequences are going to be devastating to their lives and we've got to be shouting this stuff from the housetops. Parents, you better help out in this and you better watch what your kids are seeing. You better watch what's being allowed into their minds and you better freak them out about this stuff. You better, you better warn them. And I heard, I think Brother Perry said something about it this week. One of the best things you can do for your children is you know, take them out soul winning. When you take your children out soul winning, they get to see the consequences of a life of sin. They get to see what it's like for people who are, li who are living in fornication. They get to see that. You know, you know they'll get to see just the, the way these people live, the houses that they live in, how bad they smell. You know, those young people, they'll see that teenager that's out there doing what he wants to do with his girlfriend. Seems like he's having all the fun, but they don't get to see what happens three or four years later. When, you know, they're on welfare and that girl doesn't look like she looked three or four years ago after having a couple kids and after a life of drugs and alcohol, what that does to the woman's body, it's, it's not good. They don't get to see those things. You see those things when you're out knocking doors every week. You get to see the consequences and it will freak you out bad. It will scare you. That is where fornication leads. And we need to warn people about that. Hollywood's not going to show that. Hollywood's not going to show those young people we saw the other day. I mean, they barely looked like they were 16 or 17. A young man and a young girl, and they had a baby, and she's pregnant. They have to walk everywhere in town. You know why? He's old enough to have a driver's license, but how's he going to get a car? He can't get a job. You know, he, he can't afford anything. He can't provide. You know, I'm sure they had some fun. But now they live a miserable existence. It's not worth it. It, it. That kind of thing is not worth it. You better warn your kids about this stuff. And you, 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 better, you better scare them with every story you got. You take them to visit your family that's messed up in those areas. You take them out sewing. Oh, we shouldn't judge like that. No, they need to see it. They need to see it. We drove by two prisons when we were on vacation. I like for my kids to see prison and see all those people behind that fence. That's what happens when you break the law. You get to go live at a place like that and take them out you know, to these ghettos, take them out to these housing projects and let them see the life of fornicators and where it leads. Because that's just because they're saved doesn't mean they can't live that kind of life. 
and they can't be in that kind of misery, it will come on them just as much as it will come on anyone else. And somebody's going to say something about it. I'm going to say something about it as a pastor. You need to say something about it as a parent. And let's scare them to death. Let's scare them straight in this area, as they, as they say. Let's scare them straight. And so if you want to know some place they can go visit, just come with me sometime. I'll, I'll take them to some places. I'll let them see some women that one time, you know, knocked the socks off a guy, but now they'd scare a kid to death on Halloween, you know, because that's what a life of sin does. And so with that, on that good note, let's all stand.